Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to open this. This one. And this one. Sit in the mirror. Okay. Here's your. Well, I don't know Are we going? Got the camera yep. pointing yeah, down, point down. Oh. Let's see here. Hey, everybody. <laughs> oh, this is really like a mirror. welcome. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dick Deming, Medical Director of Mercy Cancer Center and founder of Above and Beyond Cancer. Welcome to our weekly cancer education series sponsored by Mercy Cancer Center and Above and Beyond Cancer. And uh, this uh, broadcast and program is brought to you in part by a grant from the Iowa Cancer Consortium. Consortium. And um, it's my honor to have two of my colleagues from Mercy Cancer Center with me today. We have Casey Strovers. Casey's originally from Newton, home of the Fighting Cardinals, yes, yes. and uh, Casey is an imaging technologist, and then she went through school to become what we used to call a radiology technologist, but that's expanded into imaging because some of uh, what we do is not radiation, um, and over the years has uh, worked in um, many different aspects. CAT scans, and from her experience being a CAT scan imager, she has become the lung cancer screening coordinator at Mercy Cancer Center. And we'll talk about what does that mean, and, uh, what is lung cancer screening. And then also with us is Trish Steenhook. And Trish is from um, Des Moines, went to high school at Lincoln, a rail splitter. And she also has had a career in medical imaging and uh, primarily for many years doing breast imaging. And because of her vast experience with breast imaging, she has become our breast imaging navigator, helping with uh, mammograms and, and all, all the breast imaging. So we are gonna talk tonight, we're gonna have a conversation. So we decided no PowerPoints. This is all about conversation. We have a live studio audience that so will be asking questions, but you also who are attending virtually, please ask questions. Um, the way we have this uh, Zoom set up is you have to type your question in. And uh, Chris Goodale, who's the executive director of Above and Beyond Cancer, will be monitoring the chats uh, the chat room there and uh, asking questions. So um, we're having the topic tonight about breast and lung cancer screening. And the reason I wanted to talk about cancer screening is it's very important. It saves lives. But in the year 2020, um, we did not do a really good job of doing our screening. Why is that? Well, this pesky little thing called COVID. And when COVID really hit in the beginning of 2020, um, it was like, oh my gosh, all hands on deck. We got to just take care of all of these patients with COVID. And we better just put aside some of the medical work we do that isn't absolutely necessary this year. And we intentionally, and by we, I mean the whole country, the whole world said, let's just skip screening this year and focus on something more important. Um, you know, who knows whether hindsight is, is 2020 and whether that's the best thing to do, but that's what we did. Um, as a result, we're having difficulty getting everybody back into the habit of doing their screening. And uh, breast cancer screening saves lives. Lung cancer screening saves lives. And if those people who are at high risk for breast cancer or lung cancer are not getting their screening, what's going to happen is instead of finding an early stage curable lung cancer and an early stage curable breast cancer, patients are going to be diagnosed at a later stage when the cure rate is not as good. The American Cancer Society predicts that there will be 10,000 more cancer deaths in the next 10 years because of the delay in diagnosis that's going to happen because of the COVID um, pandemic and the way that we stopped doing screening. So let me just ask um, both uh, Casey and Trish your experience um, with COVID and maybe tell me your own personal experience 
canceling patients in in early 2020 who were already scheduled and calls you made to not come in and the experience you had then working in a screening mammogram screening CAT scans where you weren't doing it and how that felt and um, especially personally when you uh, were getting calls and telling people not to do it. Um, Trish, maybe let's start with you from the breast point of view, because some of our women who get screening are very, very loyal and yeah. uh, dedicated and, and uh, pay, pay attention to the dates. So yes. you probably had to call some people and cancel them. Yes, we did. So unfortunately, in March, the end of March, we actually stopped doing screening mammograms completely at all of the Mercy facilities. So anybody that was currently scheduled, we had to call and cancel and or proactively schedule them later into the summer. So we just picked a magic date of around June, June, July-ish when we start ramping back up. But if we're doing, you know, a thousand patients a month or whatever, and we were closed for three months, that was 3,000 patients that we were on a backlog. And those patients wanted to get back in right away. So once we did open back up, there for several months, we were taking care of as many patients as we could, knowing we had to follow these new social distance guidelines. We had to have our waiting room spread out. We could only have so many patients in at a given time. It was very, very cumbersome and, and heartbreaking for these women who mm -hmm. are so religious at coming back every year to the date even, you know, so to push them out months, several months before they even, and it's, it's still a catch-up game right now. It, we're still seeing the repercussions of patients not being able to get in, you know, right away when they want to be in, and we're still scheduling out in the future, and it, it's been a very hard time. Trish, do you remember any individual conversations you had, you know, maybe in March as you were calling women? Does any come to mind? Yeah, there were, there were several. I mean, there were some women who were very appreciative of, of the cancel, you know, thank you for worrying about my health and safety and COVID and um, I'm okay with waiting and scheduling. But then on the other end, you had patients who were very upset, like, no, I need to come in. This is, you know, very important to me and my mental health as well as my physical health. So yeah, we, I mean, we had conversations all over the spectrum and it, it was very hard being the sole person to take and hear those conversations and trying to explain to the best of my ability as it was a whirlwind of you know, being very fluid with the recommendations and what we could and couldn't do. And then if you had any patients who, you know, got pushed back six months, nine months, a year, who then had an abnormal scan, who felt that um, they were subject to having yep. missed a diagnosis early? Yep. We had one just um, a few weeks ago who she was 18 months since her last screening and was a callback and we found the area, biopsied it and did come back a very early cancer. But her question was, you know, when did this come? When did it happen? And, you know, unfortunately we don't know when the spot, you know, is gonna appear, but yeah, it was very much on the forefront of her brain. Like, well, we could have found it six months ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and maybe for our audience, we'll talk about the difference between screening and diagnostic. So even in, April and the, the, the busy part of COVID, if someone presented with a breast mass, correct. we did not delay getting their mammograms, correct? Correct. We never stopped doing diagnostic workups. So any patients that had a clinical symptom, we were doing diagnostics and biopsies the whole time. We just stopped the screening. Maybe briefly explain the difference between a screening mammogram and a diagnostic mammogram. Sure. So a screening mammogram is for um, women age 40 and over, for the most part, that have no clinical symptoms. They don't have any lumps, bumps, pain. We're just doing a routine screening mammogram. Um, the diagnostic mammogram is when a person, one, has an abnormal screening or has a clinical finding. So there's something they felt or their physician felt that we need to look at closer. Yeah. And, and, uh, Presenting with a lump is a diagnostic mammogram. Those were being done without delay. Correct. Correct. Um, so in the world of lung cancer, so lung cancer screening is much newer on the scene yes. than is um, breast screening. And we don't start doing true screenings 
until studies have been done showing that screening uh, provides benefit. And, and really the most significant important benefit is that it saves lives. So if we did screening and we found all sorts of abnormalities, but it didn't really improve the health of anyone, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do it. It wouldn't be something that would be a benefit. Um, and let me put you a little on the side. Do, do you want to explain to us maybe the history of how lung cancer screening came about and became uh, a FDA approved, American Cancer Society approved uh, uh, form of screening yes. to find early uh, lung cancer? Yes, the, the national lung trial was in the early 2000s and it was only for patients that were smokers. As we know in the past that, that smoking is the, the main reason for, for lung cancer. It's high risk. It's, yes, yes. Um, it's not the only one as we, mm -hmm. we know, we've learned. Um, however, it's the only one where the trial was done. So that is what the lung cancer screening program is based off of is our patients that are smokers or have a history, a significant right. history. Because if you tried to do a study of a screening technique on patients who are unlikely to have that cancer, you're not going to show that the screening provides benefit because you're not going to find many. So you start off with what's the population of patients that uh, that are, have the highest risk of having lung cancer. Yes. And that population, again, not the only right. risk factor, but the, the most identifiable risk factor. Yes. So that been, study was a randomized study. Yes, 50,000 people um, over three years, um, of patients that were 20-pack um, year smokers, I believe, um, and with a 20-pack year um, that if they stopped smoking had to be within the last 15 years. And they took, they did a low dose CT scan them over three years. And they also compared it with patients that and did it just a regular chest X-ray. So they compared the two to see, um, you know, what the, the outcome would be for, for finding cancer in those two patients. Those, those two, those two populations. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and they found that um, there was a 20% um, they found a 20% increase of patients in the CT versus the, the chest x-ray patients where they found the cancer. So previously uh, in the previous century, there had been studies looking at doing chest x-rays. So you might remember, oh, I remember, I, <laughs> there, there was common that you just did an annual chest x-ray. And mm -hmm. the whole idea was, well, we're going to find lung cancers early. Well, unfortunately, chest x-rays are not very good at finding small little tumors. So the studies of doing an annual chest x-ray never improved, uh, never reduced the death rate of lung cancer because you ended up not finding early lung cancers. So this study didn't want to compare CAT scans with nothing. They wanted to have everybody who enrolled get some sort of imaging. So we knew that chest x-rays weren't much better than nothing, but in order to randomize patients, and again, these were smokers, half of the patients got chest x-rays every year for three years. Half of them got CAT scans, which are much more sensitive at picking up um, a, a lung nodule. And the whole purpose was to see, could we find lung cancer at a point in time where it is more likely to be cured. Um, with breast cancer, most patients who are found to have breast cancer are cured of breast cancer. Unfortunately, most people with lung cancer are not cured of lung cancer. So if it were to work, it could make an even bigger impact on saving lives. And uh, I remember I was at an American Cancer Society National Board of Directors meeting when the New England Journal article came out. And I, it was just so uh, fortuitous and that yeah. it became the topic because it was a huge, uh, not only was it in the most prestigious medical journal, but it made um, headline news yes. uh, when that article came out. Um, so, um, Explain uh, what are the criteria, which patients, which people, because these are, again, this is screening. So these are patients who don't have a cough and shortness of breath and coughing up blood and chest pain. They don't have any symptoms of lung cancer. They're going to get screening. Which patients are eligible to get lung cancer screening? So they have to be um, 50 to 80 years old. 
um, their pack year history, which means how many packs a day times how many years you've smoked. That's how you figure a pack history um, has to be uh, 20 at this point. It, it's just recently changed, but, um, and they- So have if I smoked one pack a day for 20 years, I would be a 20 pack year smoker. Yes. Or you could smoke a half a pack for 40 years. So you have to have had a significant, so you can't just say, well, I had three cigarettes when I was a senior in college. <laughs> that doesn't make you eligible. Yeah. Okay, so 20 pack years of smoking. Yes. That's one criteria. Correct. Second criteria? Current smoker or a, a prior smoker that stopped in the last 15 years. Yeah, so if I had stopped 30 years ago, doesn't matter how much I smoke, I'm no longer eligible for screening because once you've stopped smoking for 15 years, your risk of developing lung cancer falls way, way down and is not a lot different than a non-smoker. So number one, you have to have, have, have significant smoking history. Number two, you have to be either still smoking or have been smoking in the last 15 years. And then the age criteria, which is 50 to 50. And you have to be 50 to 80. So, um, and that is because uh, that's when the lung cancer really develops. And so even if you're a really, really, really heavy smoker, but you're 40, the chances of finding a lung cancer are so small that right now you don't fall into the criteria of undergoing screening. Now, those screening guidelines will change over time as we, we learn more. For example, we're now seeing many younger patients with colorectal cancer. And so the guidelines for when you start doing colonoscopies have changed because we're seeing younger cancers. And that could happen with lung cancer as well. So those are the criteria. And then the, the procedure you do is a low dose CAT scan. How does that differ from a regular CAT scan like if I, said, I've got a bad cough and I'm coughing up blood and you did a diagnostic chest CAT scan on me versus a low dose CAT scan. Yeah, the, the thought is when you're having the screening, um, you're going to be doing it year after year as long as you meet the criteria. So um, they want to make sure that you know, you're know not getting a ton of radiation for these screenings that you have. So they've Chest is kind of unique in that with the lungs and the tissue around it, you don't need a lot of radiation to be able to see the spatial resolution, the, the difference between the lung tissue and, and other, um, you know, other things that are in your chest. And so it's, it, it can be done at very low radiation, which you know, is it's it's safer. It's safer. Yeah. You have yeah. to weigh out the, the risk and the benefits of having you know, 30 years of, of CT scans. And, and it's also done without IV contrast, correct, yes. correct. So if I were to have a diagnostic CAT scan of the chest, they would start an IV, they would give me IV contrast, which has some risks associated with it, and it would be a higher dose of radiation. There'd be, uh, so, so that's the difference in the screening. Again, these are patients without symptoms. Um, we can use a lower dose, we don't have to use the IV, so it makes it safer, and uh, it's good for finding small lesions, well, large ones as well, but obviously the whole goal is can we find a lung cancer when it is still curable? Yes. So maybe share with us your experience at the beginning of COVID of having to call patients to cancel their lung cancer screening. Yeah, um, your year for sure. And we, and we follow the same guidelines um, as the MAMO screening where the end of April, we, we we shut everything off, and so for two months we had to cancel all, all patients. And and we like I said, we just kind of picked a date and decided, well, if we if we come to that date and we have to cancel them again, you know, um, we'll, we'll cross that bridge um, when we get there. But so yeah, patients were, um, you know, this is a fairly new program, and so getting people to come into screening to start with was, you know, it's, it's a challenge just as people learn more about it. So stopping them when they're, you know, um, once they're scheduled is, is kind of what's going to happen after. So, but um, people were very understanding. I mean, they, they didn't want to come out. They, the last place they wanted to be was in a hospital or <laughs> a medical setting. And so I, I really didn't have any um, pushback from patients. They were very, very understanding of that. And um, when we did resume, we had an influx of patients and 
doubled the numbers for several months to, to get them back in. We, we worked a little longer hours in some locations to try to get try to get them back in. Um, so I had to make many adjustments. But. And I'm not sure how it is with screening, but for breast, we you know have those patients that were waiting, 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 wanting to come in, but that is such a small portion of the patients we're still currently missing. So we are running spreadsheets after spreadsheets, and we're actually taking the time to call and email patients to try to talk them into coming back in and saying, you know, it's been a year or two years since your last mammogram. Are you ready to come back in and start your screening? So it's a lot of legwork on our end trying to advocate for them to help them. Just yeah. because life gets busy and before you yeah. know it, they've forgotten and putting it off. And it's getting them back in the habit. It, that, yeah, I was just going to say the same. The habits are very strong, good habits and bad habits. And, <laughs> you know, when you got the good habit of brushing your teeth every day, there's probably very few of us that go a day without doing it. The habit is there. It's ingrained women who are getting their mammograms every year, every year. And then you don't do it. And all of a sudden it, it yep. just uh, interferes with that habit. So getting, getting people back to the habit. Yep. Yeah, very good. Um, so let's talk a little bit uh, more about um, the concept of, of, screening and how a patient goes through. Let's start with mammography. Sure. Um, so I want you to give me maybe two scenarios. A woman who has um, a screening mammogram that is read out as A-OK, okay. and then a screening mammogram where the radiologist detects an abnormality. So first of all, maybe patients need to know that when you go to get a screening mammogram, your mammogram may not actually be looked at that very same day. If you had a mass in your breast and you went in, you would get a diagnostic mammogram. It would be looked at while you're still in the mammography department. Mm -hmm. But a screening mammogram, patients come in and it may be looked at the next day. They, they Possibly, may... yeah. Mercy, um, when our women's center opened up, uh, a couple years ago, we have a full-time radiologist now that's in site all day. So they are now reading screenings that same, same day. day. Yes. The very, very end of the day patients, you know, the 334 or 430 patients may not be read till the next day, um, but they're not read while the patient is there. Right. So when a patient comes in for a screening, again, they don't have any clinical problems. So we're just doing a screening. They don't have any lumps or bumps. They're coming in, getting checked in, coming back. We're doing their mammogram and we send them on their way. If um, everything is normal, then they get a letter in the mail. Usually within about a week is the turnaround time for the mail. They'll get the letter in the mail, giving them the good news that their mammogram's normal. We'll see you in a year. Uh, the results are automatically auto-generated to their provider, so they get it via fax or email, however they're set up in our system, so the provider is also um, informed of them. Does the patient have access via um, the patient portal to go and see their results before they even get the, the letter in the mail? Yep, I talked to a lady today. Uh, we did her mammogram yesterday. She got on the portal and saw her report. So she knew she was expecting my call. So when I called, she's like, I know I need to come back. And I'm like, how did you know? Did your doctor tell you? I thought I called you within 12 hours. And she's like, no, I, I read it on the portal. So yes, yeah, she was able to see that on the portal. So um, you just uh, gave us the first example of a normal mammogram and they would get a letter in the mail uh, saying uh, you're fine, we recommend an annual mammogram. And then uh, uh, they would automatically go into some database to get a call in the year to They'll schedule. Get a letter. They'll get so a in letter. 11 months, our system will auto-generate the reminder letter to them. I'm stating it's time to call in and schedule your mammogram. Okay. Now, the next case, a woman comes in for a screening mammogram, and uh, the radiologist detects some abnormality. What would be the process by which that woman was informed of the abnormalities? Sure. So the process, um, once it's dictated, it auto flows into our database. And that database is monitored by myself and my colleagues there. So as the imaging navigator, any of our abnormal findings, it's my sole responsibility to be in contact with the patient and the patient's provider. So once that report comes through, I um, read the report, pull up the patient's images, 
can compare the report to the images, and then I call the patient directly, saying, hi, this is Trish from Mercy Imaging. Our doctor has looked at your pictures. Um, they are wanting you to come back in for some additional imaging, whether it be a diagnostic mammogram or an ultrasound, and then I schedule them on the phone. And I try to call them within 24 hours. Try okay. to, I, my goal is to call them before they get their letter. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now they come back in, and sometimes it might be the next day or within a few days, yep. and then they are now uh, getting a diagnostic they might get a mammogram and an ultrasound or, so, and, and I would imagine there's a little bit more anxiety in yep. their face and their voice and their demeanor when they come back in for that, that uh, diagnostic. Very much so, yep. So they'll come back in, um, start with one or the other, it doesn't matter which. Um, now with 3D mammography, a lot of our callbacks, we start with ultrasound. Back before we had 3D, it was always usually starting with a mammogram followed by ultrasound. So it can go either way, it just depends on what. So if they had a regular mammogram the first time, they come back for a diagnostic, you would do a 3D mammogram. Mm -hmm, correct. And, and then yep. probably an ultrasound as well. Yes, all diagnostics are always 3D, always. What information, what's the different information you get from a diagnostic mammogram than an ultrasound? What's the real purpose of that ultrasound? So the real purpose of the ultrasound is if there is a real finding on a mammogram, the ultrasound is going to tell us if that area is filled with fluid or if it's solid. And then that helps determine what do we do with that. Right. If it's a fluid yeah. cyst, we're done. We don't yeah. have to do anything. So if you see an abnormality on the mammogram and you do the ultrasound, go, oh, that's just a fluid-filled cyst, then you can just tell them this is a benign finding. Right. And if the ultrasound says, no, this is solid, then, right. then what would be the next step? So then if it's a solid mass that we find, um, there's two avenues. We either do um, a probably benign finding where the doctor is 98% sure it's not cancer and they recommend a short-term follow-up. Um, or if the patient provider or radiologist wants a definitive answer, then we proceed to biopsy, needle core biopsy, which is an outpatient procedure. Okay. And what would be kind of the average time between your diagnostic uh, mammogram ultrasound that says a biopsy should be done and getting the biopsy done? Sure. So if uh, the patients have the diagnostic done out at the Women's Center, they will do a face-to-face -face consult with the radiologist while they're there. So the doctor and I consult with the patient. We show them their images, explain what needs to be done. We go directly from the reading room into my office. And then there at my office, I go over the nitty gritty details that I the, you know, don't want the doctor to spend time doing. And I, that way the patient knows exactly what to expect when they come in. And then we schedule the biopsy right then and there. And it's usually within a day, sometimes three days. And it's summertime, you know, patients have vacations scheduled, so it may not be a week, but mm -hmm. we do five procedures a day in imaging. So it's, it's pretty good turnaround time to get them okay. in. So now I've had my screening mammogram. I got called back for the diagnostic mammogram and ultrasound, and the determination is that I need a biopsy. Mm -hmm. What happens the day I come for the biopsy? The day you come for your biopsy, um, it's an outpatient procedure, so patients are awake for the whole thing. They can eat and drink as normal. They can drive themselves to and from. We um, compare it a little bit to like a dental visit, but the dentist scares a lot of people too, but it's just a local numbing. So we clean the area off, give them a local numbing and uh, do the sample. Takes about an hour. Um, they get to go home. Put we just give them some ice to put on after. But it's not a surgeon making a cut and going in and taking something out. It's a radiologist using imaging to insert a needle into that abnormality right. and basically taking out some cells. Correct. Correct. So there's no incision. It's a very small skin neck. No stitches. Nothing like that. We just use that little skin glue and glue that area back together. So very minimally invasive. And the patient gets a Band-Aid and yep. gets sent home. Band-Aid ice, they get to go home. Then to when do they find out the result? It's usually around two to three business days. Um, a very quick turnaround time if it's a malignant finding, we usually hear the very next day. So then depending on um, who the ordering provider is, 95% of the patients I call directly, go over the results with them as soon as I get them. 
Um, some providers prefer to call, they have that good relationship with their patients, and so they'll call their patient directly and tell them. Um, so we usually, the patients find out usually about a day or two at most. So um, your job is to tell a lot of, to be the first person to tell a lot of women that they have cancer. It is, yeah. Yeah. So how have you learned, what have you learned about that, that conversation? how to compassionately but uh, to provide give that give that information so i've been doing this for about 7 years and i can tell you that it does not get any easier you know every day i come to work and i am going to be delivering news that is going to ultimately change the course of somebody's life um, like you alluded to earlier breast cancer if found very early is very very treatable and very curable um, I work with the most amazing physicians in central Iowa, um, so I have all the utmost faith in, in knowing that once they hear the news from me, I am literally handing them over to the best that there is. And so I build them up with that confidence and, and know that they're going to make it through this. Right. So you don't just say you have cancer, you all already have the solution. Correct. So in, in the, the conversation of letting them know I have, they have cancer, we are already in the background streamlining their referral to Katzman, getting them in with the, the surgeon. To the breast center, to see the breast surgeon. Yep. yep. Uh, that's usually the first consultation. Once they establish care with the surgeon, then the surgeons set up the subsequent appointments for medical oncology and radiation oncology, genetic testing, MRIs, PET scans, whatever else needs to be done after that diagnosis. Okay. Very good. Let's um, let's go through the same sorts of scenario with um, lung cancer screening. So I fall in between 50 and 80, closer to 80 <laughs> than 50. Um, but let's say that I smoked. I, I don't. But let's say I had a I had a 30 pack year smoking history, and I only quit 10 years ago. And I decided, you know what? I want to pay attention to my health. I'm going to get a lung cancer screen. How do I go about? getting the screen. I mean, I, my doctors never told me anything about a lung cancer screen. Yes. So a um, couple different um, ways. So, so a lot of patients actually um, come in asking about it because there, there is um, the, it's starting to get out there. Right. There Public service yes. announcements yes, are going sure. out. Yeah. Um, so they can go in and ask their provider. They do have to have an order from a provider, whether it be their um, primary care doctor, you know, um, pulmonologist, you know, any, any provider um, that they do it, and it has to be done every year. And for folks who don't know the term provider now, we use instead of doctor, because uh, many people, their primary care provider is a nurse practitioner or a PA. So we now, in medical jargon, uh, use the word provider. That's not your insurance company. That <laughs> yes, is the <laughs> human being that is providing your primary care. And the, 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 it's usually either a doctor, which could be an MD or a DO, a nurse practitioner or a PA. All of those are considered providers. So you have to have an order. Yes. Mammography is one of maybe the only imaging study in the United States that a patient can order for themselves. Screening. Screen. Screening. A screening mammogram. You don't have to have a provider ordering the screen. You can call the radiology department and say, I'm a woman and I want a screening mammogram. But you can't with the Not screening. Not at this point. Yes. We're hoping. We're, we're, we're piggybacking on mammography. We're hoping that something. Okay, so I went back to my primary care provider and said, you know what? I know about these lung cancer screenings. Here's my smoking history. Will you please order a, uh, a, a, a CT scan, CT screening? A yes. CT screening for lung cancer. Yes, and the doctors, the providers need to have um, a, a conversation with the patient about what what that entails it means you know that you meet the criteria first of all that your smoking history is you know um meet that you know that 20 to 3 pack year history um and just just have that conversation you know that are you healthy enough to to do this every year and if and if we were to find a lung cancer are you willing to to have the you know your part of your lung removed which is you know what ultimately the best or biopsy or biopsy or, yeah. or free condition. And one of the reasons for that is there are greater risks associated with doing a lung biopsy. Mm -hmm. Doing a breast biopsy has some risk, but it's uh, the risks are not huge 
of putting a needle into the breast, small risk of some bleeding, small risk of an infection, very small. But doing a biopsy of the lung has the risk of causing a pneumothorax. Also, it depends if you're gonna do the needle biopsy into the lung or you're gonna do a bronchoscopy and having a bronchoscopy is anesthesia. So all of those have greater procedures. And um, just to be open and honest, I don't know anybody that's ever died of a breast biopsy, but people have died getting lung biopsies. And, and we do know that from the study that was done, that there are some people, and there are some people you find a benign spot, you don't know it's benign, who could die having a benign spot biopsy. So because there are greater risks, again, the risks are small, in number, but could be significant. The lung cancer screening requires a conversation that is documented between the doctor and the patient about the risks and benefits of doing the screening before you even do the screening. Whereas with the breast cancer yeah. screening, you can call your, I'll call it up and order it yourself. Come on in. <laughs> so Please. it only has to be done in time for clarity. So it only has to be done the first time. The first time, thank you. First and, then, and then after, you know, the subsequent um, screenings after that, they don't have to have that, that shared decision-making consultation with the doctor. And so and it has to be documented in the charts. And mm -hmm. it's So I don't want to make too much of the risk, but I just want to explain why you can order your own mammogram for screening, but you can't order your own CAT scan for lung cancer screening. Um, and um, so that, that uh, as so, so once we, you get through that whole process, yeah. you know, you talk to the doctor and, and so the doctor orders that they send it to, to, to us at Mercy and we reach out to the patient for scheduling. We always, we have to double check to make sure that they're- Okay, meeting. you called me and you said, come in next Wednesday. So I show up yeah. next Wednesday and what yes. are you gonna do? We're gonna do a CT scan and a lot of people, to get the uh, the CT scans and the MRI scans. Is this going to take a long time? Am I going to be in a tunnel? It's not. It's a donut. It's a very simple test. It takes about three minutes. Three minutes, and I'm not. Cat scanners now are so rocking fast. Fast. <laughs> I mean, it, oh, I'm going to classify. It takes three minutes to do this cat scan. It yes. takes longer to do a mammogram. <laughs> For sure. And mammograms are more uncomfortable. A cat scan. The most uncomfortable part about the CAT scan, even for three Turn minutes, is <laughs> some people, by the time you get our age, oh, my shoulders hurt, and oh, how long am I going to have to hold my arms above my head? Now you're laying down, so but but that's probably the most yeah, uncomfortable absolutely. part. Absolutely, yeah, it, for some people, and yeah, so that's the standard. And there's probably pleasantly surprised by how, how quick it is and how. Oh my gosh, and they got some pads and things to make it nice, warm blanket. Warm you blanket. know, those are like I can sleep like this. And then the leg cushion, they like, stay here for the day. So I just had my CAT scan. Then you just go send me on my way. Yeah, but you know, you you can go because there's you know, you don't have to stop eating or anything for it. It's a you know. You can eat and drink and take medication as normal, so they can go out out their their merry way. Come when do I out. find out my results? So same as Mamo, we do send out um, letters. The patient usually takes about a week. Um, I look at all the reports directly myself as the coordinator, and so if there is something on there um, that's suspicious, um, we use what's called lung rads, which is what the radiologists um, dictate out. I want to get into <laughs> into all of that, but if um, it, it really depends on the appearance of it, the size of it. Um, so if it's depending on what it's read out, if it's a, like a lung rad three, for instance, um, you always have contact with the provider. And that's the first step is calling whoever is. Well, let's just for the sake of this conversation say it's either suspicious or not suspicious. Okay. So regardless, I reach out to the provider and say, hey, you know, this is, there's a nodule there that's suspicious. Um, what would you like to do? The recommendations are in the report because the radiologists do the recommendations best based on lung rads um, as to, again, the appearance and the size as to what should be done next. The recommendation them. could be, let's do a sh short term, let's do a diagnostic CAT scan diagnostic, in three months. Yep, three months to see Because some little spots in the lungs can be old infections or if you had it, 
pneumonia. And so uh, there's lots of things it could be. So we don't always go to biopsy for the first step. Which brings up the importance of having them done year after year, because if there is something that's abnormal in there or normal for the patient, and that's just, it hasn't changed since last year, then we don't need to do anything with that. And I know the same in breast imaging as well. So you follow them year after year. And if it's changed since last year, since your last screening, then you know that that's something that needs to be worked out. So both screening mammograms and screening CAT scans for lung cancer get more reliable as you do them. If you go in for your very first one and they've never seen your breast images or your, uh, this, it's not as easy to detect an abnormal finding from an abnormal finding. I mean, a super abnormal finding you would know, but a subtle change uh, you wouldn't know, but having previous ones for comparison makes all the it's difference so in the world. It's important to be able to, yeah. to go and get them. If you've had them done in prior places and you haven't gone to the same place, we diligently go out and look to find those. So if mine is not them. suspicious and I get a form letter saying, we'll see you next year, and then do you reach out to me next year or is it up to me to remember? No, nope, we send out letters at 11 months. Um, we also send out, because it, we have to have an order from the doctor's office, we send out reminders to the doctor's office because of those is the facts. If the system sees that if it's not done at that 13-month mark, then that actually goes out to the patient, so that sends them a reminder. So the doctors, you know, they're kind of the first year because they have to have that order, and then it goes on to the patient to say, hey, you know, mm -hmm. both of you need to get together now. It's time so to let's say I wasn't so lucky, and my... Uh, a screening CAT scan has an abnormality that's highly suspicious for cancer. Do I get that news in a letter or? No, um, you, you will get that um, from myself or for, from the provider. So um, I reach back out to the provider and say, hey, this is an abnormality here. This is what's recommended from the report. Um, we, you know, are you gonna do a follow-up yourself or do you wanna send them on to, pulmon to a pulmonologist, which is, the lung doctor. The lung doctors, um, because there's so many other things associated with the lungs, you know, like we're talking about biopsies of the lung. When you patients that are smoking, they typically have a lot more comorbidities. They have, you know, mm -hmm. they have emphysema or COPD, any of those. So with a with an abnormal, even a suspicious CAT scan, there's still a, a differential, meaning it could be still could be benign. Mm -hmm. So your primary goal is to let them know there's an abnormality and there needs to be further discussion. But it sounds like that discussion is going to be a doc, a provider having that discussion with them. Yes. So you don't call them and say, come in for a biopsy. No. No. no, not unless the, the providers ask me to do that. Some of the, you know, the, the their doctor, they've been with them for years and they, you know, yeah. they, they know. The standard they, practice in mammography is you would call and schedule them for a biopsy, but standard practice in lung is before we schedule for a biopsy, we think you now need to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation right. with either your primary care provider or if, if the primary care doesn't would prefer we would have a lung specialist do that conversation. And I would say it's more, they, they, they tend to send them more to a pulmonologist to, to do a lot of those workouts. Okay, and I know that pulmonologists are also critical care doctors and are very, very busy. So now I've just got a call saying that I've got something that is not normal and needs to be tended to. How long does it take to get in to see the lung doctor? That's where my nagging comes in, really, really. <laughs> it calls nagigators. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, you know, I, I get a hold of the pulmonary doctor at the office, and, and you know, um, I'm like, we have a patient, there's a suspicious finding, we need to get this patient in. Well, we don't have an opening, and, you know, for a few weeks, well, I, I, I think you could do better than yeah. that. I need you to do better than that. Yes. And, yeah. Let me come to your schedule book, and I bet I yes, can find. Yes, I can find something. An opening or somewhere. I call Dr. Horning or Dr. Wilcox and say, "Hey, <laughs> so, please, please." Yes. Two, two of our lung doctors who are really champions. Yes, and, they are. You know, physicians. frankly, exactly. I don't know any doctor that can't find a little wiggle room in their schedule. Yeah. Yes, and they're and they're excellent about it. Typically, I mean, it's been on vacation. Regardless, they do get them in. Okay, like, so now I'm seeing Dr. Horning. Yes. So I, a week ago was told that I have an abnormality on my CAT scan on my lung and I'm coming in and, um, and let's say for this sake that, that it does look highly suspicious for lung cancer. Yes. So Dr. Horning would have a conversation with me about doing the next step, which yes. would be. Yes. And there's a different, yeah, different options. And they, 
have that in-depth con conversation with the patient. Like we can, we can wait three months and do another, you know, another C diagnostic CT scan to see if it changes, um, or we can go ahead and do, you know, a, a biopsy. And what does that look like? Um, depending on where the location of, you know, the lesion is, they can a lot of times they can get them via bronch, and that's the preferred way. Um, just mm -hmm. so there are two ways of biopsying. Yes. And one way of biopsying it is an interventional radiologist sticking a needle in between the ribs right into the lung tumor, kind of like a radiologist <laughs> doing a biopsy of the, of the breast, except here you're going to go through the lung. So there's always the risk of, of, of having a collapsed lung. The other way is the bronchoscopy, and that is a lung doctor using a scope going down your windpipe into your lungs and then using a needle from the inside to do the biopsy. That requires a anesthesia, and it also has the risk of uh, a, a pneumothorax collapse of the lung. So that's why there's this more significant conversation yes. with the lung doctor about, do we do a biopsy? And then if we do it, do we do it as a bronchoscopy or do we do it as a um, CT guided, guided. So let's say we decided to do it as a bronchoscopy. I know those lung doctors are busy and now mm -hmm. it's going to take an hour of their schedule yes. to do a bronchoscopy on it. It's, How it's long? a lot of workup for yeah. lung cancers for sure. Um, and that takes longer. So there's always a longer uh, process to get the lung cancer worked up than to get the breast cancer worked up. And you, and you have to think about like pulmonary function tests, you know, for patients' lungs aren't, you know, if they have them, it seems they want to maybe do the a, a pulmonary function test before they even have the biopsy. See how good their breathing is. Gosh, if I have intubate somebody bad, intubate, bad uh, a lung function and emphysema or COPD, there's a risk of even doing general anesthesia. Yeah, there's a lot involved with that. So once they, okay, they go in and they get the, the uh, bronch and they get the biopsy done that way, if it comes back positive, then we have um, the option of going to the lung cancer clinic, which is a yeah. fairly new concept for Mercy, which is amazing. Patients are loving yeah, it. And we're going to talk about that, the multidisciplinary lung yes. cancer clinic. But the biopsy is done. You're going to get the results back. Oh, I just skipped that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting excited about the lung cancer. Most cancer patients, it's when did you first hear you have cancer? So now I did the biopsy. I did the bronch, mm -hmm. and Dr. Horning did a biopsy. And the pathologist, we've sort of left them out. Yeah. They they don't actually meet with the patients, but they're the ones who look at the tissue and say, this is cancer. Yeah. So Dr. Andrus has looked at my biopsy and says it's cancer. He tells Dr. Horning it's cancer. Who Again, tells it me? Days. Yeah, so it's the pulmonary doctors that reach out to the patient to have that conversation. Um, typically, they have things in the works that if it is a, if it's, if it's a, um, Come back, it comes back as a, a cancer, um, then they, they're going to need a PET scan. They need some other follow up things as well. So they usually have that put into place. Mm -hmm. So that's so with, scheduled next. With most patients who have early stage breast cancer, it doesn't leave the breast, and we don't have to go looking for breast cancer in all parts of the, uh, the rest of the body. But lung cancer, because even in early stage, it can, even in apparent early stage, it can spread then for all lung cancer patients, we look at the whole body. So we do a PET scan and we do an MRI of the brain to look to see, okay, we know this patient has lung cancer. The pathologist just told us that. Let's do a staging workup to see, is it, where is it? Is it just in the lung? Is it in the lymph nodes as well as the lung? Or has it spread to some other part of the body? like the brain or the bones or the liver. I have a question. Okay. On the lung biopsy, do they know by the pathology if it's a lung primary or if it's a met from somewhere? Great question. Most of the time, yes, but there are some times where a person could have breast cancer that has spread to the lung and the breast primary can be very small and you biopsy the, the lung tumor, and the pathologist said, this looks like breast cancer in the lung. So occasionally you will get that, where you, 
where it just doesn't have the typical staining. Now, the old way, fashioned way of doing uh, pathology is you just look at the cells on the microscope and sort of know what they look like. Now, there's so many different, we call them stains, they're different tests you do on the cells in the laboratory that can tell, for example, if it's a breast cancer cell, it'll take up estrogen, it'll have receptors for estrogen. And so you can do some things to sort out, is this a primary lung cancer or is it a metastasis from some other part of the body? So occasionally that does factor in, especially if a patient has a prior history of uh, another cancer, like they were treated for breast cancer 10 years ago, or they were treated for kidney cancer two years ago, they had their kidney removed, and then a solitary tumor in the lung. Is this a metastasis from their prior cancer from other part of the body, or is it a lung cancer? So we rely a lot on our pathologists to help us with that. So then you've scheduled me now for a PET scan and MRI of the brain. And um, uh, just like uh, breast cancer, lung cancer had many different specialists that get involved in treating cancer. And often, besides the diagnostic radiologist who looks at the images and the pathologist who looks at the, at the slides, the treating doctors for cancer include surgeons and radiation oncologists and medical oncologists. So um, in lung cancer, we've actually created a multidisciplinary, and the disciplines are radiation oncology, medical oncology, and surgery, where a patient can come to a clinic and see all three doctors at the same time. And that is our multidisciplinary lung cancer clinic, which uh, many people have been instrumental in that, in, including uh, Casey. Uh, Dr. Horning has been the director. He's a lung doctor. and really bringing it to the forefront. Yeah. And uh, so that has been, uh, maybe talk a little bit about what happens in the lung cancer, multidisciplinary lung cancer clinic. Yes, so you do have to have a diagnosis of lung cancer before you're seen in clinic. So if somebody you know, just thinks that they might have something or if, you know a patient that may have a, a, a suspicious finding in their lungs, unless they have a diagnosis of you know, be a biopsy, um, tissue sampling, then they won't be seen there. So once, um, once that's been determined and they, they go to the clinic, then they decide, you know, whether or not there's several different things to yeah. do and whether or not they there's see. lots of um, <laughs> lots of decision making based on their lung function, their heart function. Is it going to be surgery or radiation? Do they need chemotherapy? And you know what? We're going to put that on hold for right now because I see we've been talking for almost an hour. Oh my goodness. And we only have five minutes left. So let's do questions and answers. So this is mostly about the screening. We'll have another talk about the treatment of breast cancer and treatment of lung cancer. Open up for questions. Questions from the studio audience. Boom, <laughs> yes. I'll repeat it after you say okay. it. Okay, so met with that's issues. Does we ever cover that? Of course, Yeah, so the question from the audience is, what about women who have dense breasts? So go in to get a screening mammogram and the radiologist says, you know, there are four categories of density and this patient has the most dense, category D, dense breasts. How does that enter into the, uh, the report and or the conversation with the patient? Yep, so it will be on the report as well as the patient letter that the patient receives. So it will have your category of density there. Um, with a category C or D, it is recommended that those patients have 3D mammography. So 3D is the best detection to help unoverlap that dense breast in the ease of reading the mammogram. And that information, will that be provided in the letter or do they get a call? It's just a letter. Yep, okay. just a letter is what informs the patient. Okay, other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, how do you, how do you uh, women that have had uh, breast cancer, I know there's a, there's a, 
place that you look at, like a double negative or a negative or positive, or maybe I'm going the wrong. Yeah, place. so receptors. Yeah. Yeah. How, how, whether or not that really has a, even though you may hear it, it sounds like it's Come back yeah, so the question is with breast cancer, there's things called receptors. What are they and how do they factor in? So that would be after the biopsy is done and you confirm it's cancer, then the pathologist will look at three things are done on every breast biopsy, breast cell. Does the breast cell have estrogen receptors on the outside of the cell? Does the cancer have progesterone receptors on the outside of the cell? Does the cancer have an overproduction of a protein called HER2 nu? So you'll get an ER, PR, and HER2. And those results, the most favorable, would be a very indolent, indolent well-behaved breast cancer that has estrogen receptors, has progesterone receptors, and does not have overexpression of HER2. Those that information then factors into how do we treat the breast cancer, but it doesn't really play a role in how we do the screening. Right. But good question. Yes. And who had What screening? Yes. So if um if a patient has already had breast cancer and had both of her breasts removed as part of the treatment for breast cancer. Is there a screening uh, imaging study that is done? So no. So currently there's no screening done after bilateral mastectomy, but we will always do diagnostic workup if there's ever a clinical symptom. So if the patient has had mastectomy and develops a new lump or skin changes, we would always do a diagnostic workup, usually starting with breast ultrasound. So there isn't a screening, but if, if the patient detects an abnormality, and that could be something they feel, something they see, or some sensation they have, then that would lead the doctor, the provider, to order a, a diagnostic scan. And that could be an ultrasound, it could be a CAT scan, it could be an MRI, there are different things that could be done. Um, we have time for one more question. Yes, Mr. Rebelsky. I had a good, I had a good, good friend that uh, started out with breast cancer and then she had a seizure and they did uh, you know, they check things out and going to her brain. Mm -hmm. is, is that due to the type of cancer that she had? Yes, so uh, uh, so uh, there was a good chance that it could progress so the question is uh, a patient who had breast cancer and then developed a spot of breast cancer in the brain that caused a seizure. So as, as we mentioned, some types of cancer is spread to the brain very commonly. Lung is one of them that even if you have a stage one lung cancer, we're going to look at for your brain because up to 50% of patients could depending on the type of lung cancer, have brain metastases. So we look even if you don't have symptoms. Breast cancer can go to the brain, but not commonly enough that you, we would do a brain scan on someone who doesn't have symptoms. So as you mentioned, your friend had a symptom, which was a seizure, let's look at the brain. But uh, we don't typically do brain scans. We're learning more and more about which breast cancers do go to the brain in which don't. And in general, those that fall into the category of, of breast cancers that happen after menopause and are estrogen receptor positive and progesterone receptor positive, those have a very low incidence of going to the brain. So um, I have to apologize that we have so many good questions. <laughs> this has been awesome. Yeah. Um, but again, we've been talking about screening for cancer. So if you are a woman over the age of 40, 40 you are at risk for breast cancer. And that makes you eligible for breast cancer screening. And you don't even have to have your physician order it. You can call and order your own screening mammogram. If you are a uh, man or woman between the ages of 50 and 80 and have a history of smoking, you may be eligible for a lung cancer screening. Talk to your doctor about ordering that. 
both screening mammography and screening uh, for lung cancer saves lives. And with that, we're gonna close it out and I am gonna close it out tonight. So uh, thanks Chris for organizing this. Thanks uh, Mercy Cancer Center. Thanks Above and Beyond Cancer. If you want to uh, share this uh, podcast or watch it again, it will be available in two different places. You can find it beginning tomorrow at the Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel, or you can go to the Mercy Cancer to Mercy One Cancer Center website, and you will find links that will get you to um, either share the link for this program with uh, friends and family or to watch it again. Uh, thanks for being with us, and we will see you again next week. Thanks. Thank